you. That was very nicely done. Um, we have a lot of visitors today, and I just want to make a special welcome. We don't typically <laughs> greet our visitors, but we have some dignified-looking guests here from uh, Pennsylvania, and apparently we have a whole family from Michigan. It's good to have you with us, and we have uh, other less dignified-looking guests, which we won't mention. Um, so, uh, holidays. A lot of different kind of holidays around the year, aren't there? We have some holidays. I, I mean, there's the anti-Christian holiday, Halloween, right? Somebody told me the other day it was their favorite holiday of the year. And I thought, really? How creepy is that? <laughs> favorite holiday of the year is Halloween. Hmm. I mean, it, it's strictly an anti-Christian holiday. It's designed to be an anti-Christian holiday. There are other holidays that are solar and, and uh, astronomical in an in, in event, and, and then there's some that are political, you know, Independence Day. Uh, this is a church of, of mixed populace. We have a lot of immigrants here, but every country has an Independence Day, doesn't it? And so we all have our Independence Days. That's a purely political holiday. We have holidays that are made up for different reasons. And then we come to my favorite holiday, which is coming up on Wednesday, and it's none of the above. It's neither political, nor religious, nor even anti-religious, nor pagan, nor is it astronomical. It's purely arbitrary. It's only fitting that that should be my favorite holiday. Purely arbitrary. There's nothing about New Year's Day that makes it special in any way except in as much as it happened by chance to be placed there under the Gregorian calendar which followed the Julian calendar which repaired some particular drift of Easter. Pretty important reason, right, to have the Gregorian calendar. We, we observe the Gregorian calendar uh, created under the auspices of Pope Gregory simply to correct 10 minutes worth of of lag in the length of the year, let's be honest. It takes a little bit less, 10 minutes less than they thought. And in order to make that precise, they had to fix that in the 1500s. And so Pope Gregory made us a new calendar. And so we all the world bows down. No, no, they don't bow down. But they, they all use Pope Gregory's calendar. And it so happens that the year starts over on January 1st, and there's no other good reason for this to be a holiday. It's not even the Asian New Year. There are other New Years in other parts of the world. But I love the New Year celebration. I don't understand why they give us a day off work for it. But I love the New Year celebration for one reason. And that is that I worship a God of making things new. And it gives me an opportunity once a year to say something exciting in my life that God is making a new thing for me and a new thing of me. So I like the New Year's. We're going to have an agape feast. It's going to be good. We're going to have a lot of good times. We're going to have baptisms. We're going to have communion. Isn't communion a good way to start the new year? Yeah. All kinds of good symbols there. And I, I like the New Year best of all. And I like it, one of the reasons I like it is there's this beautiful text in Lamentations of all places. Lamentations 3 verse 22 says, The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies are fresh every morning. Isn't that beautiful? I don't know that you need a sermon if you just have that text. You know me, I'm going to write that one on the wall. His mercies are fresh every morning. I don't believe in tattoos, but maybe the back of my hand would be a good place for that text to be. Our real text today, however, is in the book of Philippians. It's right before Colossians in the New Testament. I had a ribbon there. I cheated. I'll give you a minute to find it. So Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12. Now, Paul had a little problem in his church in Philippians. He had some perfection people. 
Now, I don't know exactly what form the perfection people took. Scholars have a little disagreement on this. But perfection people are all around us. We've run into them different times. Now, I'm not talking about perfectionists, okay? Everybody has been plagued with or known a perfectionist. A perfectionist knows what perfection is and insists on it and then recognizes when they don't meet it, right? Perfectionists are typically not perfect people. They're people who strive for perfection. It can be annoying to the rest of us. I'm, I'm kind of uh, one of those anti-perfectionists because uh, I, I, can, I, can walk through, I can walk through a chaotic pile of rubble, sit down and read a book and ignore it completely. I can ignore messes, I can ignore noises, I can ignore, when I was in college, I used to uh, have an early bedtime, I really believed in an early bedtime, and I would lay down and go to sleep, and my, my roommate would be typing at the desk, not 12 inches from my head, and this is in the day when typewriters actually made noise, kids, and so he would type, and he would type, and he'd say, can you go to sleep with me typing like this, and I said, brother, I can go to sleep anywhere. And I would just go right to sleep. So I can ignore chaos. Perfectionists cannot do that. Okay? So a perfectionist is a person who understands what perfection is, desires that we all meet that perfection, and annoys you until you do. Okay? So that's what a perfectionist is. I'm not talking about perfectionists here. I'm talking about perfectionals. We'll call them perfectionals. That kind of rhymes with professional. So a perfectional is people who think that they have arrived. Now, you may or may not have known any of these people, but I believe that they are a subset and a natural uh, pathology of every belief system. These are the people who believe that they've got it together. They have arrived. And in Paul's day, apparently, they believed, many of these people believed that they had gotten it so together that the resurrection would become unnecessary. Scholars have, have, have ferreted out that there was a perfectionist movement in the early church that believed that they would obviate, you know, that's a self-limiting belief when you die, right? Oops, I guess he wasn't quite as perfect as he thought. Well, I've known a lot of perfectionists. I've known a lot of people who think they're really, really perfect. And sometimes, you know, they let on. Sometimes they don't. Usually they let on just with an eye look, and it's usually when somebody else does something wrong. <laughs> right? Remember that old t-shirt, I'm with stupid with an air? Well, you know, they don't know what they're doing, but I do. That's kind of the message that professionals carry. And they, they carry that message to the point, I mean, you've seen the preachers. They get on the television and they tell you, if you'll just get your faith act together, you'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise. And so it is that we're very surprised when these people who have told us how to get your faith act together wind up with prostitutes and lose their ministries for a time. They always seem to come back like a bad penny. They always come back. But we have people who believe in the church that they're pretty good, that they've got it together. Let me tell you three things that all the people who think they've got it together have in common, three errors that people who think they have it together have in common. Number one, people who think it, they have it together always are using others as their measure of whether or not they've got it together. Okay. Number one, they're always comparing themselves to others. And I want to give you a hint. If you looked at my life, you could think you're pretty good. Because I've looked at your life and I think I'm pretty good works both ways see if we look at each other's lives and we recognize I don't have your problems and we ignore our own then we think we're pretty good and if you look at my life and you say I'm glad I don't have his problems and you don't look at your own you can look pretty good you know we had some up in the east coast I used to teach a class up there and there were some people up there who really truly believe there's a, there's a statement and it's in, our, it's in our teachings and it's true and it says at the time of the end there will be a people whose behavior as a result of their unity with Christ will be so in line with God's will that they will essentially be perfect I believe that teaching. Those people are not here yet. That time 
is not here yet. And the people who used to come to me and I had that, that, that thing about them that they were kind of that way, I always wanted to say, if you'll just give me five minutes with your spouse, I can solve this problem. I can figure out what the problem is if I could just have five minutes with your spouse because I will figure out where you're not perfect. Now, most of these people won't come right out and say it. They won't come right out and say they're perfect. What they'll do is they'll compare themselves to others. And Jesus gave an example of it in the New Testament. He, remember he says, the, 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 the Pharisee who's praying, he said, I thank the Lord that I'm not like this guy, a sinner. That is a perfectionist. In fact, the whole Pharisee religion is all about perfection, isn't it? Paul has just gotten through in Philippians here telling his story about, I was by the law blameless. That's right here in Philippians chapter 3. I was blameless. I don't know how you say that. You know, I guess he could say in the outward performance of the law, and that's the second thing about perfectionals. The second thing about perfectionals is they always measure their behavior by outward appearance, never by the heart. The Bible says that men look on the outside. God looks on the heart. And people who are perfectionals all look at outside appearances. And they say, look, just like Paul did right here in Philippians 3, he says, look, I'm a, I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. As to the law, blameless. How do you say that when there's a commandment that specifically says don't covet what your neighbor has? You know, I'm in this beautiful church with all these beautiful people who have a bunch of beautiful homes and beautiful cars. And how do you not covet? I mean, that's something that takes years to overcome. I, I covet you people all the time. And, and, you know, it's a constant struggle. We pray about that. But, I mean, how do you not covet, right? And so for Paul to say, I'm blameless under the law, he's got to be ignoring what's under the surface, don't you think? So here's the text. It says, not that I have already arrived or attained or am already perfected, but I press on. And then this part is really interesting. This, less, this sentence says, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Jesus Christ first possessed me. And in the Greek, it's an interesting play on words because the word possessed there is twice. And he says, I press on to own that for which Christ owned me. I press on to get that for which I was gotten. See how it works? I'm looking to get the, the thing that I was gotten to get. So he's making a play on words saying, God reached down on the road to Damascus. Jesus reached down and he got me. And now I'm reaching out to get the thing for which he got me. And what is he talking about? He's talking about sanctification, isn't he? He's talking about perfection. He's striving on for perfection. That's what he wants to do. And he says, this is what I want. I want to be, have the perfection that Jesus possessed me to have. And then he goes on to say, I do not count myself to have already achieved it. But I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Okay, what does it mean to forget the past? Surely we can't forget the past. Paul says so. That word in Greek can be translated consigning to oblivion. I like that one better. Consigning the past to oblivion. Have you done that? See, it's not easy. It's not easy because we have this terrible, terrible tendency for a thing called regret. Has anybody experienced regret? Teddy Roosevelt said that only people from 30 to 50 have a useful life and work experience. People under the age of 30 are consumed by their dreams, and people over the age of 50 are consumed by their regrets. Wow, that's kind of powerful, isn't it? There's a, there's a quote from a television show. He says, I regret nothing. I rue and I lament, but I regret nothing. The discontented believe that their regrets are about the past. That one will leave a mark, won't it? So what do you regret? 
Do you have things in 2013 that you regret? Oh, can I seed the pump on this one? Did you say something that you shouldn't have? Did you let a relationship lapse that shouldn't have lapsed? Did you not say something that you should have said? Did you not apologize where you should have apologized? Did you ignore a person who deserved your attention? Did you fawn over somebody that did not need your attention? Have you spent where you shouldn't spend and have you failed to spend where you should have spent? Have you eaten? Never mind, I won't even go there. (laughs) Have you had an experience of infidelity? Have you had an experience of doing those things that you knew you should not do? You know, they say self-hate and self-love are equally self-absorbed. We can look at ourselves. You know, the, the perfectionist is so busy looking at themselves that they never get to the point of being a Christ centered person. So here's the question. What are your regrets? What are you carrying from 13 and before? It may be that you have stuff from 2000 still. What are you carrying? I think of that story about Ellen White very favorably comments of the book Pilgrim's Progress. And in it, our our main character, our protagonist Christian, carries a heavy burden. Are you carrying a heavy burden today? Are you carrying a burden from 2013 that maybe it's time, it's time to let go of? What are you carrying? Because you know, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of people that try to let go of things, and they can't do it. The question is, has you, have you assigned your regrets to oblivion? Now, let's make sure we understand the difference between regrets and, and repentance, Okay. There, I I was doing my research and I found that some places define regret and repentance the same. And it isn't. Repent is to turn. Regret is to feel bad about. Okay? So, do you feel bad about something or have you repented from it? It's interesting that the Bible has some really interesting imagery that it uses for what God is going to do. He says in Isaiah 118, come. Now, let us settle this, says the Lord. Though your your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. And though they are red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool. Talking about something changing, isn't it? I mean, he's, he's making imagery that says, look, this is going to change. It's going to change from one thing to something completely different. He's not going to go through a metamorphosis. He's going to change it. And, Paul, and, and, and David says, he will remove from us our sins as far as east is from west. Now, the question is, if we're carrying regrets around, why are we carrying regrets around? And how do we stop? Well, I'm going to give you a hint. Number one, we're going to have to stop. We're going to have to take a look at it. There's a a story of the two monks. They've taken a vow of not even, in celibacy, they're not even going to talk to women. So they're taking their pilgrimage, and they're walking across the landscape. And as they're walking along, they come to the edge of a river. And there at the edge of the river is a woman crying because she can't cross the river. And the one monk, the first monk says to her, I cannot help you. I have taken a vow against touching women. So I'm sorry, I cannot help you. And he crosses the river. The other monk quietly picks the woman up, carries her across the river, and deposits her on the other side. And as they walk away, the first monk starts to excoriate the second monk. You broke your vow! And he ragged on him, and he tagged on him, and he scolded him, and he chided him, and he criticized him, and he beat up on him all day long and all into the evening as they walked. He beat on him and beat on him and beat on him. Finally, they sat down to rest for the night, and the second monk said to the first monk, I 
picked up a woman and carried her for a few feet and set her down. You've been carrying that woman the rest of this day. What is there in 2013 that you're still carrying? Are you carrying some things that you've got in your heart and your mind? First thing we've got to do to get rid of our regrets is we have to pick them up again. There's an old writer who used to say, if you're going to work with 11-year-olds, you're going to have to become 11 years old again. You're going to have to let it hurt you one more time. And it's true, if you're going to identify with people, you have to get where they are, right? And if you're going to identify with absolutely letting go of the burden of your regrets, you're going to have to pick them up and take a look at them and figure out where they come from, what they're made of, and why you're carrying them. See, people carry different regrets for different things. I could do things, I probably have done things this year that you would regret, but I don't. And you've probably done things this year that I would regret that you don't. Because regrets come from our heart training, don't they? Maybe there are things that I did this year that I should regret that I don't. And vice versa. You too. Don't just put it on me. There may be things in your life that you should regret. In fact, if you ask, I'll tell you a few. There are things in our lives that maybe we should regret, but we haven't yet got the heart for it. There are heart issues that are different for each of us, and you've got to take a look at what it is that's bothering you from 2013 and before that you're still carrying around and see why it is. And then the second thing we've got to do to eliminate our regrets is we have to own them. See, we're pretty good, these human people, we're pretty good at blaming others. At my house, when something goes wrong, I have four women. And I just look down the line, and I say, I hold you personally responsible for this. It's easy. I have a good life. It's never my fault. I have four women to choose from at all times. We're good at blaming other people, but you know, if you're going to let go of something, if you're going to give something away, if you're going to destroy something, it better belong to you first. And you cannot give up sin and regret and trouble and pain that you don't first own. So you need to look at your regret and you need to own it. You need to own that part for which you are responsible. Wouldn't it have been interesting in Eden if God had come to Eve and said, what did you do? And she said, I chose to rebel from you and I am so sorry. An interesting take, an interesting twist. If he'd come to Adam and said, who told you you were naked? And Adam could have said, God, we've blown it, help us. Instead of blaming the woman and blaming the serpent. Instead of trying to put it off on somebody else. The first thing we've got to do is look at our regret. And the second thing we've got to do is own that part of it that belongs to us. I don't know what part of your regrets for this year you own. But you need to look really carefully and you need to take everybody else out of the picture. And if there's a way that it's true, you need to hold yourself personally responsible for your rebellion. And then there's a third one, and this is where it gets really beautiful. So, you remember Jesus meets this paralytic and he says, oh, do you, do you think you need to be healed? Sure. He says, okay, your sins are forgiven. What happened? Everybody went crazy. They said, what do you mean, sins are forgiven? I thought you were gonna heal him. Yeah, you're going off script, man. What are you doing? And he says, I said that so that you guys would speculate that the Son of Man can forgive sins on earth. No. He said, I said that that you could know that the Son of Man can forgive sins on earth. Now, do you know that? 
or are you still speculating? Because here's the problem. Most people who are carrying around burdens on their back like Christian, they just don't believe that God is powerful enough to take away their sin. And you know why? Because they're perfectionals. Because they've chosen to base their future on their behavior and on self-focus rather than on believing God. Jesus came... If he came and he lived and he did all those signs and wonders for any other reason, it's less important than the reason of proving to you that he's powerful enough to make the change right now in your life. That's why he came. He came to live and demonstrate his power before you so that you, by reading the stories of his power, can believe that he is powerful enough to remove your pain and to remove your sin. And right here, right now, today, when we have a made-up, arbitrarily set holiday called New Year's Day, you have four days. You have four days to go fix with other people in your life what needs to be fixed before you come and take communion on Wednesday. Jesus said, if you come and you bring an offering and you want to be all friendly with me, that's all good. But before you do it, you better think hard and see if you've made a problem with somebody else out there first. You have four days. You have four days to correct with your brother. He, told, he called him your brother. He says, if you have something with your brother... He says, go get it fixed. And I'm telling you, you have four days before communion. Why do people want to avoid communion? I think it's for exactly this reason. Oh, yes, is it a little awkward? Yes, it's a little awkward. Do you know what? We do a lot of things that are a little awkward. Have you ever stood in line? That's awkward, isn't it? But we stand in line to get a driver's license. We stand in line to get movie tickets. We stand in line to eat dinner at some restaurants. We stand in line lots of times. It's awkward, but we do it because we want what comes from it. And I'm going to tell you that there are some awkward parts of communion. But we do it because it's worth it and there's a blessing in it. So I want you to take the four days before Wednesday. And I want you to do exactly what Jesus said to do, which is leave your offering and go out. And do what you can to reconcile your life before the end of the year. I'm not telling you what I want you to do. I'm telling you what Jesus told you to do. So today is your day. Today is your opportunity. Tomorrow, the next day. And then I want to see you back here on Wednesday. Ready to start the new year free of regrets. Do you believe that God has the power to take away. Here's Paul. I mean, there's so many texts in the New Testament, so many texts in the Old Testament that say, remember. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember the Lord your God. Remember, remember, remember. All the way through the Bible, there's all these remembers. And here's this one queer text that says, forget the past. Press on to the future. Can I paraphrase? Forget every evil of 2013 and press forward into 2014. The polls show that people thought 2013 was a bad year. Well, let me give you a hint. We re-inaugurated a president that was elected by the majority of us and the democratic process worked. The terrorists from the Islam who promised destruction on our cities did not destroy our cities. The North Koreans who promised to nuke the United States, Japan, and South Korea failed. The Iranians who promised to destroy and wipe Israel off the planet failed to do so. The stock market did not crash and wipe out your retirement once again. You can call 2013 anything you want to call it. The biggest problem that comes out of 2013 
is that God has not yet made me perfect. And here's Paul. He says, I haven't been made perfect yet either. I'd take, by the way, I'd take Paul's level of imperfection. I'd take it. I'd trade for his. He says, God hasn't yet made me perfect either. But this, I tell you, this is what I want you to do. I want you to forget about the past and move to the future. Isn't that what God told Lot and his wife? So, I don't know, there are very few of you here old enough to remember 1954. There was a great thing that happened in 1954. In the spring, a fellow from Australia named Landy. Landy was a great runner, and he set a new record. He ran one mile in less than four minutes, 1954. And then following Landy, an Englishman by the name of? Nobody remembers? What? Bannister, Dr. Bannister, two months later, also ran a four-minute mile. Now, most people credit Bannister with breaking the four-minute mile, but it was Landy who did it first. Both of these great runners, who, by the way, were true amateurs, practiced an hour a day, right? Both of these runners met in Vancouver. Canadians all know this story, right? They met in Vancouver in order to run what was called the Miracle Mile, the two greatest milers on the planet were going to run against one another. And Landy had a plan. I'm sorry, uh, Bannister had a plan. His plan was he was going to run the first and second laps at his pace. The third lap, he was going to relax a little bit so he'd have a good kick because Bannister had a nice kick on him. And in the fourth lap, he was going to come roaring past and he was going to clear the field. And so the race began... And Landy took off like a rocket. And he ran and got 15 yards ahead of all the other runners. And so much for Bannister's plan. He had to pour it on just to keep up with Landy. And so he started running for all he was worth. And he ran most of the race 15 yards behind Landy. And he ran and he ran, and finally, and so much for resting the third lap, his plan was gone. He started to run and tried to push and push and push, and finally he got about five yards behind Landy. In the end of the third, beginning of the fourth lap, he was about five yards behind. And then Landy did an amazing thing. Landy couldn't figure out where Bannister was. And he was afraid that Bannister might have been closer than he thought. And Landy turned and he looked. And the race was over. The rest was history. Bannister passed him like he was standing still. He took his eye off the finish line and he lost the race and he lost history. Most people think Bannister was the first four minute mile. Landy was the first. Landy, Bannister said after the race... That if, if Landy had not slowed down, there was no way he could have caught him. But he lost his concentration. He lost his focus. He looked back out of fear. And I want to ask you, isn't that exactly what Paul is telling us not to do? He says, do not let, do not let your past frighten you out of your future. He says, this thing I know, I press on. I press on toward the mark that Christ has set for me. We keep our eyes on the future and let God deal with our past. He's promised to do it. He's faithful in every promise. Now you have four days. I'm going to ask you in the next four days to make the telephone calls that you need to make. If you want to be even more easy about it, write the letters that you need to write. Write them on paper. Make the calls, make the visits, write the letters. Clear up the problems that you've created this year to the best that you can. And then trust God to wash you clean. And come here on Wednesday 
And let's enjoy a feast and communion and a baptism together. Let's let God change our lives for 2014. Will you join me in that? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we don't know how to do this. All we know how to do is mess up and then, then we let that sour in our hearts. But we want our hearts cleaned today. We ask for your forgiveness and we know that you have promised to make us white as snow. You've promised to separate from us our regrets and our sins and our problems as far as east is from west. We claim that promise. We trust you for the cleansing. We trust you for the forgiveness and we trust you for the freedom in our minds of knowing that we are free and fresh and your grace is new this morning. Please give us this day your heart of forgiveness and give us a fresh start in 2014. Let us be your ambassadors in a new and better way. We ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.